Thank you, Pierre Henri. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm hoping that you're feeling bright and energized and uh, not suffering too much from the effects of your guided tour and uh, the great dinner that we had last night. Uh, because generally when you say money laundering to people, their heart sinks. <laughs> and it's not necessarily the topic that you would choose to have at um, half past nine on a Friday morning. And even more so, I think, if you're a company lawyer, because if you're a company lawyer like me, you probably think money laundering and think, oh, that's one of my other colleagues who knows about that and um, does something about that. Uh, and I'm here this morning to persuade you that actually, at least for this particular aspect that I'm going to talk about, um, that's not the case. And you are very much the people who have to be um, involved in this and understand what's going on. Um, what I'm going to talk about this morning is not all of the directive, you'll be pleased to hear, um, but only those bits of the directive, which is a 2015 directive, and you've got copies in your background materials, which relate to who's a beneficial owner of a company, uh, what does the directive say that they have to do, um, and also although the directive is not yet implemented, um, there are already proposed changes to the directive. And then I thought what I would do is share with you some of the experience that we've had in the UK um, in our efforts uh, to start implementation of the directive, because I think, although I'm not suggesting that you necessarily have to follow the solutions that we've adopted in the UK, it might be helpful for you to know what sort of problems we have encountered when we've been thinking about this. So as you know, the reason that we have directives on money laundering is because there has been an increase in terrorist financing and money laundering throughout the world. And the idea was that we should have common measures and approaches as to what countries and firms do to try and stop that being the case. Um, the date for implementation is June of next year, but the Commission has said that it's very keen to encourage member states to implement the directive early, and they would like member states to have done that by the end of this year. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, I got in touch with the Commission and asked uh, which member states had already implemented the directive and they told me that at that stage, uh, no member state had actually informed them that they had implemented the directive, which is not to say uh, that member states are not necessarily working hard to get to a situation where they can Im implement the directive, um, as you'll see when I talk about what the UK has been doing. But I think it's symptomatic of um, both the focus that the Commission is putting on this and its general importance uh, that there is such a push to get this directive into force and people actually doing something. The other thing that it's worth remembering is that this is a minimum harmonizing directive. So if any member state wants to go further than the minimum standard set by the directive, um, they are free to do so. Um, so if you are in an organization where you have to cope not only with the requirements in your own member state, but setting up systems for your group because your group operates in more than one member state, um, you will need to be sure what approach each individual member state is taking so that um, you come up with standards that meet all of the requirements, not just the, the minimum set by the directive. So what the directive is intended to do, I thought I'd give you just a brief overview on this before we then concentrate on the bits for, for companies, um, is that it sets out what a definition of money laundering and terrorist financing is and says that member states have to prohibit that happening. Um, and also member states have to make assessments and individual firms have to do risk assessments. Um, the people who are affected by this directive are people like financial services institutions, auditors, tax advisors, notaries and other legal professionals, trust and company service providers, estate agents, and also people who provide gambling services. Um, and as we would typically think of money laundering requirements, 
It's mainly to do with applying due diligence measures to people who you are your customers in order to try and identify who they are and where the money uh, that they're using is coming from. So, for example, I, I with my brother and sister at the moment, um, am buying a small piece of land in Northampton in the middle of England, and I'm having to explain to my solicitor where the small amount of money for this piece of land is coming from as part of these due diligence measures. Um, at a much higher level, member states have to make sure that they have a financial intelligence unit um, and firms are required to report to this financial intelligence unit on their own initiative um, if they know or suspect or have reasonable grounds to suspect that funds are the proceeds of a criminal activity or are related to terrorist financing. The directive has provisions about data protection, how you keep records, what statistical data um, you have to collect and provide. And firms that are part of a group have to have group-wide policies and procedures um, that they implement in order to deal with, with these aspects. And the national competent authorities have to monitor uh, whether these policies are working effectively um, and that people are taking measures to make sure that there is compliance. But the bit that we're particularly interested in this morning is the bit that deals with beneficial ownership information, uh, particularly in relation to companies. So the $100 million question, maybe even more than that, is who is a beneficial owner? And anyone who has followed the discussions in the corporate governance area about who are uh, the ultimate owners or beneficial owners, whatever phrase you use to describe this person, is a really vexed question um, and hard to do. But this directive gives us a definition. So what Article 2 says is that a beneficial owner is any natural person, so it has to be a real person, not a, not a company, who ultimately owns or controls a customer, or it could be a real person on whose behalf a transaction or an activity is being conducted. And then the bit that we're interested in, in the case of corporate entities, um, it tells you that at least certain people must be treated as being the beneficial owners of the company. So the question you have to ask yourself for a company is, who are the natural person or persons who ultimately own or control that company? And they can do that in a number of ways. Um, they can either do it through direct ownership or indirect ownership. And it has to be ownership of a sufficient percentage either of the shares of the company or the voting rights in the company or some other ownership interest in that company. And I think that last category is there um, to try and accommodate the, the many different corporate forms that we find in the different member states. The definition makes it clear that bearer shares count for this purpose. And it also makes it clear that if you can control the company in some other way, uh, that is also caught. So you can see it's a very wide definition. There are two cases uh, where companies are not covered by the directive, and that's because they are subject to existing requirements. So if you're a company who is listed on a regulated market, which is subject to disclosure requirements which are consistent with EU law. So if you're a listed company and you're subject to the transparency directive requirements, um, then you're not subject to these requirements. And similarly, if you're a company which is subject to equivalent international standards, which make sure that there's adequate transparency of ownership information, then you're exempt as well. And the reason for that is, you'll remember, under the Transparency Directive, there are already requirements for people um, who have an interest in the voting shares of a listed company to notify, um, and that gets notified to the company and through the company to the market as a whole, so the market knows who are the people who have um, control over that entity. And so because there were those provisions already, and that information is already in the public domain, um, it wasn't felt necessary to include those companies within these requirements. The directive um, also tells you what 
what should be taken as an indication of direct ownership. So if you've got a shareholding of 25% plus one share, um, or you've got an ownership interest of more than 25%, which is held by a natural person, um, then that, will, that must be caught in the definition. Um, and I find diagrams helpful when I'm thinking about these things. So if you imagine that the company that you're, you're worrying about is the one at the bottom, and you know that there are three individuals who are shareholders in that company, uh, one of whom has 30%, another 50%, and the third one 20%. Under that definition of direct ownership, um, individuals one and two would be caught as beneficial owners, but individual three wouldn't, um, assuming that there are no other relevant facts uh, that apply to individual three, because they've got less than 25%. The directive also tells you about indirect ownership and what's to be treated as an indication of indirect ownership. Um, and here it's where you've got a shareholding of 25% plus one share or an ownership interest of more than 25%, which is held by a corporate entity. And that corporate entity is under the control of a natural person. Or there are multiple corporate entities which are under the control of the same natural person or persons. So again, if I give you that in the form of a diagram, um, so you've got an individual at the top who controls two companies, and then each of those companies has a share of more than 25%, uh, then the individual will be treated as being a beneficial owner for the purpose of the directive. Now, the directive is very flexible, and what it says is that member states can decide, if they want to, uh, that something lower than 25% is to be treated as an indication of ownership or control. So if, if your particular member state feels that 20% is enough to give you control, uh, they, are, they can make that decision. Also, Another option that the directive gives you is to say you can apply the tests that are relevant for when a parent undertaking has to prepare consolidated accounts and use those um, as a way of deciding when somebody has got control. And I'll come to those in a second. Interestingly, and I think this is a bit of bad drafting in the, in the directive, um, the definition goes on actually to impose a substantive obligation because the definition says um, if the company, when it looks at uh, the information that it's got, uh, decides that it can't identify anyone, or if it's in any doubt, uh, then what it must do is it must record what action it's taken to identify its beneficial owners. Now, obviously, the, the test for when a company has to prepare consolidated accounts is quite a useful test for companies because they're already under obligations under um, the directive to produce consolidated accounts in certain cases. And it's quite helpful, I think, uh, to be able to use this as one of the ways of determining which shareholders are controlled. Um, so if you have a company which owns most of the shareholders or members' voting rights in another company. Um, you'd have to prepare consolidated accounts. Or if you can appoint or remove most of the members of the administrative management or supervisory board of a company and you're a shareholder or member of that subsidiary undertaking, you prepare consolidated accounts. Or if you can exercise dominant influence, and it doesn't matter whether you're doing that under a contract or through a provision in your constitutional documents, um, and you're a shareholder or member of that company, that's another situation where you prepare consolidated accounts. Or the last one is where, in fact, um, most of the members of the administrative management or supervisory bodies have been appointed as a result of you exercising the vote. So that could be... Uh, that the other shareholders haven't bothered or did never bothered to vote uh, on things so that even though um, you might not technically have enough votes to control, in practice you do so. Or you might have an agreement uh, with one of the other shareholders or members at, so that they always vote with you and through that agreement you can control 
um, a majority of the voting rights in the, in the other company. And that's another case where you would prepare consolidated accounts. The definition of beneficial owners um, for the purpose of the directive goes beyond what's relevant for companies. Um, but I thought it was still worth mentioning this because very often um, as company lawyers we do deal with trusts and similar entities. What it says for trusts is that the beneficial owners are the set law, the trustees, um, a protector if you have a protector, the beneficiaries of the trust, um, or if you can't yet work out who the beneficiaries are going to be, the people for whom the arrangement has mainly been set up or operates. Um, and then any other natural person that exercises control over the trust, whether that's direct or indirect ownership or in some other way. And similarly, for foundations or any other legal arrangements that are similar to trusts, it's any real person, any natural person, who holds an equivalent or similar position to the ones that I've just described for trusts. So again, you can see a very broad range of people who are caught in the beneficial owner definition. So what is it that you have to do? Well, the people who have to take action are the companies themselves or the other legal entities. And for every member state, it's the companies that are incorporated within that particular member state. And what the directive says is that you have to obtain and keep adequate, accurate, and current information on the people who are their beneficial owners and the details of the interests that they hold. And also that if somebody who's an obliged entity, so um, a notary or a gambling company or whoever it is who's trying to do customer due diligence, if they come to you and need that information as part of their customer due diligence measures, then you have to provide the information that you have about your beneficial owners um, to those obliged entities. And the directive also says that the information has to be kept in a central register in the member state. Um, there's a bit of flexibility as to how the member state does that. So it could be in a commercial register or the company's register or some other sort of public register. And the member state has to tell the commission um, what the characteristics of the mechanism that they've chosen are. And they're allowed to collect the information that they need on beneficial ownership in accordance with their own national system. So there's some degree of flexibility for every member state as to exactly how that collection of information and recording works. Once the company's got the information, who are the people who can have access to it? Well, firstly, um, and importantly, the competent authorities and the financial intelligence units. Um, and they must be able to have access to the information in a timely manner and without any restrictions. The other people are obliged entities um, as long as they are following the requirements for customer due diligence under the directive. But also anyone else, any other person or organization, as long as they can show that they've got a legitimate interest. And the directive sets out what information they are allowed to have access to. Um, and that must be at least the name, month and year of birth of the beneficial owner, their nationality, uh, where they reside, and what the nature and extent of the beneficial interest is. Um, data protection rules apply to all of this. And um, as anyone knows, data protection seems to become a a more vexed topic on a, on a daily basis, trying to get the balance between the rights of the individual to be protected and the, the rights of authorities and others who have a legitimate interest in that information. One of the things that member states can do is that they can say uh, that somebody who wants access to the information has to register online and you are allowed to charge a fee for it but the fee is not allowed to exceed the administrative costs of providing the information. The system has to work in a way so that when a competent authority or a financial intelligence unit wants access to the information, 
that they can get access without the relevant person knowing that that's the case. Um, and it's not just the competent authorities and financial intelligence units from your own member state who are allowed access to this information. The system has to work in a way that if a competent authority from another member state or a financial intelligence unit from another member state wants access to this information, um, you have to be able to provide them with access to the information in a timely manner as well. The directive does set out some exemptions uh, that member states have an option to apply if they want to do so. They don't have to uh, include these exemptions in their national legislation, but the exemptions can't apply when it's either a competent authority or a financial intelligence unit who wants access to the information. But in other cases, uh, member states can say that you don't have to provide access to information um, on a case-by-case -case basis in exceptional circumstances. And that's where access to the information would expose the beneficial owner to a risk of fraud or kidnapping, blackmail, violence, or intimidation, or where the beneficial owner is a minor or is otherwise incapable in some way. And then the, the last thing to mention from the directive is the fact that the directive says that by June 2019, the Commission must put forward a report to the Parliament um, as to how there could be a proper interconnection between the various registries in the member states that hold the bits of information. And yesterday we were talking about the interconnection project um, and the directive foresaw that it would be really helpful if the information being kept in the various registries could be inter interconnected in that way. And what the directive says is that where uh, it's thought appropriate, the report should be accompanied by a legislative proposal. Um, but the directive has already been superseded by events, because as I said, uh, before we've even got to the date by which the directive has to be implemented, uh, we already have proposed changes to the directive. I think, as Pierre-Henri was saying earlier this morning, um, we are seeing at the moment a fall in the trust that the general public has in companies and um, the people behind companies and events like the Panama Papers do nothing to reassure the general public um, that on the whole the majority of companies are legitimate businesses carrying on business for the benefit um, not just of the people who set them up but for the people who work for them and for society generally. But there is, there is a, I think, greater degree of concern about companies and who owns them. Um, and I think this is driving some of the, the proposals about making sure that there is more transparency of information about who owns companies and, and what they do. Um, and so one of the proposals is that one of the company law directives, Directive 2009-101, which is the directive that replaced the first company law directive and sets out what information has to be kept in relation to companies in a central register in a member state. Um, the proposed change is that that directive should be amended so that the information on beneficial owners will be disclosed under that directive. Um, it's also being proposed that you would no longer need to demonstrate a legitimate interest in order to have access to the information about who are the beneficial owners. Um, and reflecting some of the data protection concerns, it's also proposed that information shouldn't be available for more than 10 years after a company has been struck off. And that the interconnection of the registers should be brought forward, so rather than there just being a report and a proposal, um, this directive or this proposed directive is, is suggesting now that that should happen. The other thing is that it's proposed that for certain sorts of entities, um, what counts as an indication of ownership or control should be reduced down from 25% to 10%. Um, and this applies to what are called passive non-financial entities. Um, and they're defined in Directive 2011-16. And these are basically entities that are there just to be an intermediary. Um, they don't create income of their own. 
and they are there mostly to channel income from other sources. And I think because there is particular concern about what are entities like that there to do, um, it's felt appropriate that the test that you apply to those entities should be lower than the normal test for what would constitute control. It's also being proposed that certain sorts of competent authorities um, should definitely fall within the competent authorities who have access to this information. So if you're an authority with responsibility for money laundering or terrorist finance, um, something like a tax authority or an authority which prosecutes money laundering or is responsible for tracing and confiscating criminal assets, um, that you, you should definitely be one of the types of authorities that would always have access to the information. And also, uh, if you have any sort of credit institutions or financial institutions or obliged entities that are some sort of public official, that the exemptions um, as, that would stop you getting access to the information shouldn't apply. And as I say, um, that the central register should be connected up. Um, this proposal has only been put forward this summer, so we're still in the early stages of how the discussion is going to go on that. Um, but we should keep an eye on that. So I promised I would talk a little bit about our UK experience. As PRE said, um, David Cameron has been a great uh, proponent of the UK being at the forefront of taking action in this area. Um, and so uh, we have been discussing this for quite some time. Um, and I have to tell you that our experience as UK lawyers is it's really tricky. Uh, if I had counted up all of the hours that I have spent trying to understand what the government was trying to do and the discussions that we have in, in London, we have a group of company law lawyers under the auspices of the City of London Law Society, so um, a representative from all the big city firms who practice in this area. Uh, it would be thousands and thousands of hours. Um, and that's just when we discuss it amongst ourselves. Uh, we have written very long papers for government about what their proposals are and how it's going to work in practice. And when you put yourself into the position of the person in the company who is the person responsible for um, collecting this information, keeping it, keeping it up to date, and thinking about what happens when things don't quite work as planned, um, you begin to realize how much time it's going to take up for those sorts of people. What we did was we made changes to our Companies Act. Um, it came through something called the Small Business Enterprise and Employment Act 2015, which received royal assent in 2015 and came into force in April of this year. Uh, so we've got primary legislation, but we also have two lots of secondary legislation, so the more detailed stuff, which are very long. Um, and because we thought no one would make head or tail of the words in the legislation itself, we have three lots of guidance uh, for people who are trying to deal with this area. So firstly, we have some statutory guidance. So that's guidance that the courts must look at uh, when they are trying to work out what the meaning of significant influence or control is. And that guidance is 14 pages long. Uh, lots of people said, well, lots of company secretaries won't have a time to read that. So we need something shorter. So we produced a summary guide for companies uh, because we were trying to help small companies which have relatively simple affairs get to grips with what they needed to do without complicating it for them if they didn't need to. So the summary guidance is five pages long. But the guidance you really need to read, particularly if you're advising on this, is the last guidance, which is for people who have significant control, and that is 47 pages long. And it's the sort of thing where you get your cold towel out in advance and you settle down and you make sure that no one is going to distract you while you read it. Um, so, you know, if, if ever you're feeling that you can't go to sleep and you're in need of something, all this guidance is available online. Um, and it will only take you half a page and you'll be feeling very drowsy indeed. So what were the sort of things that we were trying to get to grips with as we were trying to implement this? Um, who do we count as a person with significant control? That's the, a person with significant control or a PSC is the jargon that the UK has chosen to use to be the equivalent of who is a beneficial owner. 
And I think that's partly because in, in the English legal system, beneficial owner already has a particular meaning. Um, and we didn't want to confuse that meaning with what we were required to do for directive purposes. And interestingly, uh, what the government has decided is that if you're a government or a local authority or an international organization, for the purposes of our legislation, we're going to treat you as though you were an individual, uh, which wouldn't be necessarily obvious. Next question. What if you've got joint holders of a share? Uh, well, what we decided was that each of the joint holders will be treated as holding the shares or the rights that they have um, so that you treat them uh, separately and you treat both of them as being beneficial owners. What if you have a situation where you've got somebody who's acting as a nominee for somebody else? We decided that we would look through the nominee so we wouldn't treat the nominee as being a beneficial owner, we would treat the person for whom they were holding the shares as being the beneficial owner. What if somebody owns the shares but has used the shares by way of security for some loan or something else? We decided that we would continue to treat the person who had given the security over the shares as being the beneficial owner of the shares um, rather than the person to whom they had transferred the shares or given the shares by way of security. What do you do when there are rights attaching to shares which are only exercisable in certain circumstances. And it may vary from member state to member state, but in the UK we're very flexible about the rights that you can attach to shares. And if you can think something and write it down, then you can make that a right that attaches to a share. So it's quite usual in the UK to say that a share will only have voting rights in particular circumstances. Um, what we decided on that was that you would treat the right as being exercisable only whilst the relevant circumstances apply, or if the person can control whether the circumstances apply or not, so they are in effect in control, we would treat them um, as, as if the rights were applying, even though they hadn't actually exercised their control yet to make the rights apply. Um, and what other cases should fall within situations where somebody exercises significant influence or control in practice. Um, and what about when they're doing that through a trust or a firm? Those are the sorts of bits where we get into such a degree of detail that I don't really think it's helpful to you for me to spend a lot of time explaining the conclusions that we came to. Um, but if you're interested, they're in the guidance. What other things did we think about? Where does the company keep its register? In the UK, um, traditionally, companies have been required to keep all of their company records at their registered office. But there has been a bit of a trend in the last five years or so um, to start making better use of digital technology and allowing companies, if they want to do so, to keep some of the information they're required to keep under our Companies Act with the central registry. Um, so. Uh, we have an option at the moment for the UK so that companies can choose, um, rather than keeping a register at their registered office, to keep it at company's house. Exactly what information do they have to put into their register? If you're the company secretary or the person who's got this job, um, you need to know what information it is you've got to put into the register. How often do you have to update the information in your register. Remember uh, that the directive says that you have to keep accurate um, information. So as the person at the company who's you've just prepared your register, when do you next have to go back to the people who you think are the beneficial owners and check that that's still the case and that they haven't, for example, decided to give their shares or the, you know, the beneficial ownership of their shares to a child or a husband or wife or a, some other third party or entered into some ar uh, new arrangement, you know, so how often do you have to check on that or, you know, in what circumstances, when should you be put on notice? And I think that's quite a difficult thing because it's obviously, you know, you can't be doing it on a daily basis. The world will come to a, a stop if you do nothing except ask for information about beneficial 
ownership of shares. Um, where we got to in the UK was when you become aware of a change, um, you should take some action. What do you do if you write to the person who you think is the beneficial owner um, and they don't reply to you? Um, and I think the answer to that is you go back to what I was talking about, you know, you record the steps that you've taken um, and if you can't get an answer out of somebody, you can't get an answer out of them. Um, what if you maybe don't know who the beneficial owner is, but you've been dealing with an advisor that they have, uh, whether that's a legal advisor or some other third party? Is your member state going to put an obligation on those people to provide information to you? How does that fit with things like legal professional privilege? Um, what do you do as a company if you write to them and they don't provide information to you? One of the things we decided in the UK, and this came um, after quite a lot of discussion with the government, was that in addition to putting an obligation on the company to ask for information, we felt that there should also be an obligation on the people who are the beneficial owners themselves to provide information to the company. Now, the directive doesn't require you to do that, but we felt um, that to have a workable system, that was an appropriate thing to do. What penalties and sanctions are you going to apply if somebody doesn't provide information when they are supposed to do that? Um, and how are those going to work? Uh, we had had in the past in the UK provisions which required people who were interested in shares to provide information to the company. And it's quite usual for companies in the UK, particularly listed companies, to have provisions in their articles that say, if people don't provide information to the company when they are required to do so, that you can suspend the rights attaching to their shares. So you wouldn't have to pay them dividends. They wouldn't be able to vote at shareholder meetings until they provide the information because we think that's the way that you really get people's attention is by saying you can't have your money, you can't exercise your influence whilst you're uh, not complying with the requirements. But is that the right approach to take? And how do you protect people who may be um, involved in a chain of ownership if you, if you apply a sanction like stopping dividends or um, preventing people from exercising voting rights, there may be innocent third parties as part of that ownership chain who are going to suffer in some way because you've applied the sanction. And do you need a process uh, under which they can somehow intervene as between the company and the person who hasn't provided the information in order to protect their own position? And what if the company makes a mistake and shows you as being a beneficial owner of the shares in circumstances where you don't think that that is the right approach? Uh, so we decided we ought to have a process for rectifying an incorrect register. Um, so you can see uh, that all of that is, is quite complicated and there's quite a lot of things to think about. The other thing that the directive doesn't really go into any detail about is how does all of this work in a group of companies? Um, which is the company in the group of companies that keeps the register? Um, what information must it keep? And one of the problems um, I think with the directive is that it applies on an entity by entity basis. So the directive's presumption seems to be that every company has to keep its own register, which means that throughout a group you're going to be duplicating the same amount of information a lot of times. And interestingly, although there's an exemption for listed companies, there isn't an equivalent exemption for subsidiaries of listed companies. Uh, so you get the situation where the listed company at the top doesn't have to have a register of its own because it's reporting information under the transparency directive, but the subsidiaries of that listed company are subject to this requirement. And how does this work where, as is usually the case in complicated groups of companies, um, you've got companies which aren't in your own member state somewhere in the chain of ownership, and that might be in another member state, but it might be um, a country outside the EU, uh, which may have no equivalent sorts of requirements. And I thought I'd finish um, just by giving you a couple of examples. Um, I should warn you 
that uh, these, please don't take these as being the right approach for the directive because in certain cases the way that the UK um, has chosen to implement the directive uh, I think goes further than the directive actually requires and we have adopted a particular approach. So if I start off with a, a simple example, say uh, you're thinking about company A at the bottom of um, my screen and you're trying to work out who should company A show in its register of beneficial owners and assume that company A is a subsidiary of another UK company uh, which owns more than 25% of its share capital and that that company uh, then has another UK company uh, which also owns more than 25% and owns a majority of company B. Um, the way that we have made it work is that we, in order not to duplicate inf information in the various companies' registers, instead of getting every company to put the same information, we just look up, um, and you, uh, if you've got a company above you which is also subject to UK requirements for keeping a register, you just put the name of that company in your register, and then that means that the person who looks at your register would know that they have to go and look at the register of that company. And so somebody looking at accessing this information has to work their way up the chain until they find the company which has got the sort of ultimate beneficial owner information in it. What about if you have um, a similar sort of makeup but the company at the bottom is owned by a non-UK company? Um, but the non-UK company is owned by an individual who has a majority stake in this non-UK company. In that case, what the UK company do, would do would be to show the individual as being the beneficial owner on its register. So it looks through the other company. And the reason that the UK decided to do that was because being a non-UK company, it's not subject to our regime and we weren't therefore sure exactly what information it would be showing. So in that case, we say the UK company has to record the information about the ultimate beneficial owner. If you have a case where you don't have any beneficial owners, so say you have a company and it's got five individuals and all of them hold less than 25% of the shares, and assume uh, for the sake of this example that they don't own or control in any way, so there are no agreements between the shareholders or anything like that. Um, what your register would say is that the company either knows or has reasonable cause to believe that there isn't anybody who's registrable. Um, and so if you looked at the register, that's what it would tell you. And what about if um, the interests are held indirectly? Uh, so this is a case where the company uh, has an individual who has majority stakes in two co other companies and those companies, when you put them together, have more than a 25% interest. So in that case, under the UK approach, um, you'd look through the legal entities and you'd put the name of the individual onto your register. Now those are pretty simple examples and you will know from looking at, at group structures uh, that it's not difficult to come up with examples which are much more complicated than that. And if you think about private equity groups uh, where you start getting trusts involved or people using limited liability partnership structures and things like that, you can see how quickly it can become quite complicated to work out whether a particular person has um, a controlling interest or not and whether they should be shown as being a beneficial owner or not. I hope that gives you um, some idea of the sorts of things that we have thought about. Um, the UK hasn't finished implementing the directive. Uh, in fact, just a couple of weeks ago, a consultation paper came out from the government looking at uh, the ways in which they might implement the remaining parts of the directive relating to trusts and things equivalent to trusts. And one of the things that we're going to have to change is at the moment, <coughs> companies only have to provide the information on beneficial owners to the central registry once a year, whereas what the directive requires us to do is to make that information available all the time. And the consultation paper is asking about 
what's the best way to do that? Obviously, if you've opted to use the central registry as the place where you keep your record, it will be being kept up to date as you make your changes to it, but that's not the case for all companies. So good luck. Um, <laughs> it, it is, I think it's, it's something that we're going to have to get to grips with more because I don't think the pressure for who are the people behind companies is going to be any less at any time in the near future. Um, maybe we will get better at working out um, how to work out who these people are, what are the tests that we apply. Um, generally, I find that the more we do something, the better we get at it. Um, I certainly hope so. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have, as long as they're not too technical questions. 